So here we have the last three pages of this section entitled Beyond Bureaucracy, um, the final three pages of chapter seven. <clears throat> These men of the future already man some of the ad hocracies that exist today. There is excitement and creativity in the computer industry, in educational technology, in the application of systems techniques to urban problems, in the new oceanography industry, in government agencies concerned with environmental health and elsewhere. In each of these fields, more representative of the future than the past, there is a new venturesome spirit which stands in total contrast to the security-minded orthodoxy and conformity associated with the organisational man. The new spirit in these transient organisations is closer to that of the entre entrepreneur than the organisation man. The free-swinging entrepreneur, interesting phrase, um, <clears throat> the free-swinging entrepreneur who started up vast enterprises unafraid of defeat or adverse opinion is a folk hero of industrialism, particularly in the United States. Pareto labelled the entrepreneurs adventurous souls, hungry for novelty, not at all alarmed at change. It is conventional wisdom to assert that the age of the entrepreneur is dead and that in his place there now stands only organisation men or bureaucrats. Yet what is happening today is a resurgence of entrepreneurialism within the heart of large organisations. The secret behind this reversal is the new transience and the death of economic insecurity for large masses of educated men. With the rise of affluence, there has come a new willingness to take risks. Men are willing to risk failure because they cannot believe they will ever starve. Thus, says Charles Elwell, Director of Industrial Relations for Hunt Foods. Executives look at themselves as individual entrepreneurs who are selling their knowledge and skills. <coughs> Indeed, as Max Ways has pointed out in Fortune magazine, the professional man in management has a powerful base of independence, perhaps a firmer base than the small businessman ever, ha ever had in his property rights. Thus we find the emergence of a new kind of organisation man, a man who despite his many affiliations remains basically uncommitted to any organisation, he is willing to employ his skills and creative energies to solve problems with equipment provided by the organisation and within temporary groups established by it. But he does so only so long as the problems interest him. He is committed to his own career, his own self-fulfilment. It is no accident in light of the above that the term associate seems suddenly to have become extremely popular in large organisations. We now have associate marketing directors, research associates and even government agencies are filled with associate directors and associate administrators. The word associate implies co-equal rather than subordinate and its spreading use accurately reflects the shifts from vertical and hierarchical arrangements to the new, more lateral communication patterns. <clears throat> Where the organisation man was subservient to the organisation, associative man is almost insouciance towards it. Where the organisation man was immobilised by concern for economic security, associate man increasingly takes it for granted. Where the organisation man was fearful at risk, associative man welcomes it knowing that in an affluent and fast-changing society, even failure is transient. Where the organisation man was hierarchy conscious, seeking status and prestige within the organisation, associative man seeks it without. Where the organisation man filled a predetermined slot, associative man moves from slot to slot in a complex pattern that is largely self-motivated. Self where the organisation man dis dedicated himself to the solution of routine problems according to well-defined rules, avoiding any show of unorthodoxy or creativity, associative man faced by novel problems is encouraged to innovate. Where the organisation man had to subordinate his own individuality to play ball on the team, associative man recognises that the team itself is transient. He may subordinate 
subordinate his individual. He may subordinate his individuality for a while under conditions of his own choosing, but it is never a permanent submergence. In all this, associative man bears with him a secret knowledge, the very temporariness of his relationships with organisation frees him from many of the bonds that constricted his predecessor. Transience in this sense is liberating. <clears throat> Yet there is another side of the coin, and he knows this as well. For the turnover of relationships with formal organisational structures brings with it an increased turnover of infer of the an increased turnover of informal organisation, and a faster throughput of people as well. Each change brings with it a need for new learning. He must learn the rules of the game, but the rules keep changing. The introduction of ad hocracy increases the adaptability of organisations, but it strains the ad the adaptability of men. Thus, Tom Burns, after a study of the British electronics industry, finds a disturbing contrast between managers in stable organisational structures and those who find themselves where change is most rapid. Frequent adaptation, he reports, happened at the cost of personal satisfaction and adjustment. The difference in the personal tension of people in the top management positions and those of the same age who had reached a similar position in a more stable situation were marked. And Bennis declares, coping with rapid change, living in the temporary work systems, setting up in quick step time, meaningful relationships, and then breaking them, all augur social strains and psychological tensions. It is perhaps possible that for many people in their organisational re relationships, as in other spheres, the future is arriving too soon. For the individual, the move towards ad hocracy means a sharp acceleration in the turnover of organisational relationships in his life. Thus, another pr piece falls into place in our study of high transient society. It becomes clear that acceleration telescopes our ties with organisation in much the same way that it truncates our, our relationships with things, with places and with people. The increased turnover of all of these relationships places a heavy adaptive burden on individuals reared and educated for life in a slower paced social system. It is here that the danger of future shock lies. This danger, as we shall now see, is, inten is intensified by the impact of the accelerative thrust in the realm of information. End of chapter 7